Well, thanks for staying up all day, and <laughs> I promise I'm, I'm not too harsh. Um, let me try to tell you a story, actually. It's late in the day, so we're not going to start proving something seriously. Um, <laughs> let me try this. So imagine you want to um, understand an outbreak, uh, flu, whatever it is, Ebola. Um, you want to know what happens at which time step. You want to know reliably. Uh, you want to know what is it you're chasing, right? So I heard this below the skin and above the skin, and my interpretation would be that some kind of microevolution happens in the body of the host as the disease is being transmitted over some kind of social network, right? So if we can agree of this being a reasonable scenario, I would be facing to explain to you as a mathematician how such an evolution of a virus is going to happen or could be modeled. That's one thing. The other thing, because I'm already outclassed by MADAF and DSSL in making those simulations, I'm not trying to go there. What I could do, though, is I could offer to help when the general comes with his question. Right? How would you validate? And I'm trying, uh, following my red line, where I want to talk about the spread of this uh, disease over the social network, I'm trying to address this because all that mathematicians can do, we're not data-driven, not at all, but we're driven by structures. So what we try to identify are structures that help us understand deeper. And maybe I can get this across. So first, up, down, is that? Keyboard, forward, arrow. Here we go. All right. Okay. So let's go to the microevolution in the host. So obviously, uh, let's say we have an RNA virus. We know these viruses mutate. So these mutations will oftentimes be neutral, hence Moto Kimura uh, uh, costs the term uh, neutral evolution. So, but some of them will not. Now, we want to know, after a certain amount of time, where will the vi virus be functionally and structurally if we uh, assume that there's a correlation between the two. So, that's all obvious. What's not so obvious is, um, how can I describe this? So, what I have to do is I have to be able to create, say, a folding algorithm that makes from sequences structures. Now, there are two questions that come immediately uh, uh, to mind. And uh, number one, this must be an accessible folding algorithm, so it, it, you must be able to use it with a nice interface and everything. Secondly, it has to be reliable. And thirdly, it has to produce something that we understand. So back in the, um, in the 80s, Mike Waterman, who is fortunately uh, here with us, um, uh, um, created the same basic mathematics of a structural concept that we all use, namely that of secondary structures, right? And so, 1978, <laughs> right? Even, even further back. So, so these class, these structures, we all use them in, 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 in folding algorithms, the Zucker folding, RNA fold, uh, Vienna RNA, there are many different versions of it, but it's a dynamic programming, a very efficient um, algorithm folding these structures. So he has given us a concept of what we mean by structure. So I'm not quite content with this, and neither is he. So a few years back, we got together and uh, tried to push the limits of what we mean by structure. So now you will say, well, I mean, now this guy is going to get really weird, right? But, but there's mathematically a precise way to talk about what we mean by higher structures, right? And this is what I'm trying to convey to you. It's important when I want to describe the evolution of this virus, because this virus may not be confined in the secondary structures, because as you may know, in secondary structures, you don't have any cross-serial interactions. You guys with me still? So you need to push the concept beyond what Mike invented, right? And he was on board on that, and I'm very happy to have a paper with him on this, where we, where we push those limits, okay? 
And this requires us to talk precisely about how we can push those limits. And this requires us to go beyond what we would typically do when we talk about networks and when we think of networks as graphs. So, so to go beyond networks as graphs means, in this picture, and I just stick with pictures, um, it means that you replace an edge by a ribbon. So you pass to a belt instead of just a link in a graph. And by doing so, you can enrich the structure, uh, eventually forming what mathematicians call a surface, which you then would say, why, why, why would he create a surface, right, for the love of God? The surface is going to give me invariance as a mathematician, and the invariance give me a grading about the structures. This is not so abstract because you don't have to be a topologist to get the invariance. You can read some of the diagrams in no time. So in literally linear, linear time complexity, I can immediately compute all the invariance, and they give me um, a filtration of this structure space. So what this means, what this means is now that I have higher dimensional structures in the sense of more and more complex structures, I can fix a complexity level, and then I can look for the essence. As I was saying, it's not data that drives this, it's a structure. So it's how is the world of these structures organized? So the Waterman structures are essentially, uh, as we discovered, right? They're essentially the base layer. They are the genus zero guys and then comes higher and higher ones. And we all know what genus one is, as we all know what a donut is, right? So genus one is a donut. It's essentially a structure that I can put on a donut drawn without intersection of the chemical bonds. And then it turns out that this space has an inner structure which allows me to reduce it to a, a very few configurations. So forget about the lemmas, that's all theory. But here are the, the only configurations that you can build on a donut. You see the four top configurations, and those configurations uh, represent essentially the four different classes of structures that you have when you step um, uh, a plus one over the normal secondary structures that we're looking at. So now, with this picture, we can actually go into a database and we check whether we find this. Right? So we go into the RNA databases and we cross-check these structures and we realize that, interestingly, a very high percentage of structures is actually just a concatenation and nesting of these motifs. Everybody with me? By that I mean that I take one of those structures, I expand one of the little intervals. I'm colorblind, so I probably will never see the light here. Let's see. Aha, aha, not that colorblind. You're, you're with me? I can go here, expand this interval, make it bigger, and squeeze one of the other guys, or the same, if I choose to, this, this, or this, into this interval. So I've nested the structure in itself. And that's clear that it's not going to do anything complicated to the structure. It's just a kind of repetitive way to look at this thing. So, so complexity classes, there are only very few. And once you fix one, you only have a finite set of configurations. So you get a structure of this space of virus realizations, depending on uh, mathematical invariance. And this gives us a way to establish the mapping. Let's go back. I said I'm interested in the evolution of you know, an imagined disease over time. And my task is to tell you where is the virus going in the host as time progresses. So I need to tell you which different structural configurations will the virus entertain, discover, in, uh, in the course of time. So you want to know, as a decision maker, will it become airborne, right? What kind of structural features will be preserved? And this line of mathematics can uh, answer these questions, right? Now, then you will say, to establish the mapping, we need 
we need computer folding algorithms, and despite the fact that Madhav could probably do a much better job, and he probably will, we at least have proof of concept folding algorithms for these structures because we want to do something. So at the end of the day, when my guys are here, uh, then we are going to have uh, algorithms available for for everybody uh, who's interested in RNA and RNA folding, who will take sequences, I think up to 500 or 700 nucleotides, and can generate um, all structural um, uh, configurations on a certain complexity level. So this is quite hands-on, and the basic building blocks of these configurations um, are uh, the, f the four archetypes that you hear depicted again. And we can uh, compute the energies of those guys and can build beautiful recursive algorithms uh, along the lines that Mike already established for the secondary structure folding. So I'm not going to tell you that there is slightly more mass involved because it's late in the day to get these things recursive. But the type of mathematics that you can expect from us is very uh, plastic. So we cut and we deform configurations in order to teach a computer to make those manipulations. In, in essence, instead of folding a pseudonotted structure, we fold a normal structure and permute the base sequence later. So this is a fair way of, of looking at this. It's a clever a posteriori manipulation on sequence levels that can uh, uh, create the, the knotting we want. So now you're going to ask me for performance, and normally I would be very proud to tell you that this algorithm performs better than all the others, but we all have been in so many conferences where people make those claims. So let me try to make this, um, invert the statement. I'm not even surprised that the algorithm is better. And the reason why the algorithm is better than anything that is out there is because it's the only algorithm that actually takes into account the building principles. All the other algorithms do not. So in all other algorithms, you will always find a generic penalty for pseudonauts. But that is nonsense, because different ways of pseudonauting have specific energies. And people are incapable of incorporating this because they don't have the underlying model. They don't have the decompositions. They don't have the unambiguous grammars that stand behind this. So the G-fold thing here right, is actually fairly sensitive, and it has a, a very nice positive predictive value. And uh, Phoenix Wang, who can't be with us, he's still struggling to get his visa, but in May he's going to be here. He's, uh, he's going to push this algorithm, so this is really nice and usable, and I encourage you to talk to us about incorporating this when you're interested in, in RNA folding. So we can push this a little bit further, uh, namely when you are interested, suppose, right? So now I'm giving you a portfolio of things you might be interested in. Um, uh, if you're interested in interacting RNAs, we can use similar techniques to evaluate the likeliness of certain structures to form. Specifically, if you think that certain regions are going to bind, here you see these, uh, I think it's red, but right? Be patient with me. So if you, uh, right, if you have a particular focus on certain regions and whether they uh, are being established in the complex, we can actually give you, using partition function methods, we can give you the probabilities of these regions. So you know where they bind and what type of binding will be there and how many nucleotides there are. And we can give you probabilities for these, uh, for these stacks to form. And uh, here is a diagrammatic presentation uh, which depicts the fact that we can have all sorts of interesting crossings even between the strands, right? Which is actually, to my knowledge, no algorithm can do this actually. This is something we can actually nicely do. And here is an example of a, um, of a Homo sapiens snow RNA where you actually have these motifs. You have these specific crossings uh, happening in nature and they can be captured. And this is a nice topological model. All these algorithms run in polynomial time. They're fairly efficient. And, uh, and we hope we can uh, bring them and put them to, to use. All right. So this 
For us, the RNA is a paradigm. It's a paradigm as it is responsible. It takes the, the phenotypic form of the virus that I want to catch, and it is inside my body. And if I understand its evolution, I have to actually understand networks. Um, let me explain. So this particular RNA structure is going to be realized by many sequences. We all know this. All these sequences make the same structure. So the function is unique for all of them. What drives evolution is, say, a diffusive process of the genotypes that morph on these neutral networks. What drives the evolution of this process um, is actually how two of those networks intertwine in a very unphysical space, namely sequence space. So all the things that you've seen here are an integral part in this consideration, these uh, evolutionary runs where you try to understand what is the virus going to do, when it, is it going to become airborne, how is it going to change. On a completely different level, uh, I guess above the skin, we want to know what is going to happen as the disease spreads over a network. Now, again, networks. First, we had the microscopic network. Now we have the, if you will, macroscopic network. And that means, how can we decide whether me being node T at some location after some time that people have become aware that an outbreak has happened, what's the probability for me to stay healthy? Fair question? So you may say that's not difficult, um, and you will want immediately to compute all the paths between you know, somebody whom you know is for certain sick and yourself. The problem is, well, the disease is not transmitting deterministically. There's a probability involved, right? And even though there may be many or a few paths, it heavily depends on how the paths are located on the network, whether I get sick or not. So let me try to explain. If all those paths have just one link, and if I were to remove it, and they all become disconnected, we all would agree I really want to remove that link, right? So it's not so easy. We are actually looking for independent paths. And my point here is a Gedanken experiment that I want to avoid, uh, invite you to join with me, right? This is what math is about, right? This Gedanken experiment says, so you, we need to understand the independent paths in arbitrary networks, and that's usually very difficult. I think Stephen would agree with this on this one. It's very hard to do this. And, and here is... Here is a story I want to tell you about what Mars can do to help you to make progress on this one. So here, instead of looking at these paths, which are very difficult to understand and to control, what you could do is you could actually play a game. You could say, I'm not interested, actually, directly in the probability of me being infected. I want to hypothesize about the following. I want to hypothesize about the actual path of the disease in the sense of whom it infects first. I want to trace the causal path of the system until it reaches me. Now, you have to think about this for a second. When I do this, there is only one path from the infected person to me. You guys are with me? One pass, because I'm only measuring the guy who was infected first. There's no way that there's ever going to be a closed pass uh, composed by people who were infected first. It's impossible. So if I have that, then I actually have a tree, right? And instead of trying to count the number of paths from S to T, that may be dependent and very difficult, related, correlated, right? I'm actually counting, uh, counting interpretations of the data that I'm being given. And the interpretations are subtrees of the data. And now these things are entirely independent because there's only one way this happened. I mean, right? There's only one way this happened. So only one of them is actually correct, and two of them has absolutely nothing to do with each other. You guys are with me? Right? 
So this means counting, counting instead of the dependent paths, counting these realizations is completely independent. And all I can do is a combinatorial game. And we can certainly play combinatorial games. Let me assure you this. And this is, this is a way where mass is actually looking at a very well-known problem that can be computed, you know, studying the corresponding processes on a graph. But you don't want to actually do this when you try to theoretically understand. Using this trick with the, with the causal um, traces, the causal footprints that the disease leaves on a given network, you can actually compute all sorts of things, including very cool validation arguments. You can compute all distributions, and you can get a lot of information uh, about the size, even, of outbreaks and the potential um, uh, impact on you, right? So, so in, in mass, it is important to identify structures that allow you to compute. It's not going to be a competition to Marav. He can compute this better and faster. But what mass can do is it can give you a structural understanding of the particular processes that, that at present can be so powerfully computed. And I think we have a paradigm shift because we can compute much faster than we can validate our computations, right? So here we're talking really about validation by a model. And a model is about ideas and not about data. And here in this case, it is about decorrelating paths that are hopelessly intertwined and that you could never control if you look at the, the problem from this perspective. All right? So I think we're going to have Andre give a quick. So we have two minutes until we hop into the panel. Yes, but we can. Give him, yeah, yeah. right. So, so I, rather than me talking all the time, I have 